Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. We're back with another episode of the, the esteemed series, Investment Analyst Explains Investing References in Pop Culture. Episode two. I put out a community post asking which movie you guys would like me to review on this channel. And the answer was pretty resounding, The Wolf of Wall Street. A movie that follows the life of Jordan Belfort, a Wall Street broker that was convicted of securities fraud for making a company that effectively pumped and dumped shares and did a bunch of other stuff. It's a movie that's since kind of come to define the culture and imagery of, of subreddits like Wall Street Bets that has given us famous quotes, including the one about rookie numbers, and that gave us whatever this was. And if you've seen this movie, you know that it's a wild ride. There's a lot of crazy antics that happen throughout the film, and you'd be forgiven for not fully understanding what actually happened from a financial standpoint. But between all the drugs, the hanky-panky, and the other stuff, there's actually a lot of financial concepts and even events that occur in this movie that, you know, might have been hard to catch as a viewer given how fast-paced they are. And you know, the, the drugs, hanky-panky, and, and other stuff. So today, in proper party pooper fashion, we're going to learn. <laughs> forget the, forget all the exciting stuff. We're going to cover some of the concepts and explain what exactly was going on in this film, what happened in different scenes, um, and why Jordan Belfort went to jail. A few things right off the bat. Firstly, I'll have to be a bit creative with how I show the movie clips that I'm referencing, uh, because uh, the first installment of the series, if you will, on the big short was actually demonetized for showing too much of the video, even though I was trying to explain what the scenes were. So I apologize if the cuts are a bit jarring. YouTube, fix your copyright system. And secondly, even though a lot of this stuff did allegedly happen from the hookers in the office to the chimpanzee handing out paper to workers, to even the people being thrown at targets. It is worth keeping in mind that this movie is an adaptation of the book, The Wolf of Wall Street, which is a memoir written by Jordan Belfort himself. And given that the man is quite literally a convicted con man who by his own admission was on 22 different types of drugs a day, it's worth taking it with a, with a grain of salt. It's not to say that crazy stuff hasn't happened on Wall Street in the past and that Wall Street hasn't had this crazy culture around it, but it is to say that, you know, some stuff might have been embellished or whatever have you. So keep that in mind. But regardless, let's hop into it and explain what's going on. So one of the first scenes is Jordan Belfort getting a job at L.F. Rothschild, a stockbroker company that uh, not associated with the Rothschild family, but is a real investment company that, fun fact, actually took the firm Intel public. And after a day on the job where he's essentially helping brokers find clients that they can sell positions to, he goes out for dinner with uh, Matthew McConaughey's character, Mark Hanna. Uh, who is based on a real person. A lot of these characters are based on real people, even though sometimes the names are changed, such as with Jonah Hill's character. And this is where we're really introduced to the sketchy stuff that's already happening on Wall Street, even before Jordan Belfort starts his scam. Mark Hanna explains that as a brokerage company that can buy and sell positions for clients and make recommendations to clients, they don't actually care if the client makes money because this firm makes its own money from the transaction fees. So every time the client wants to buy or sell a share, they're paying 1% of the value of that purchase to this brokerage company. So they don't care themselves if the client ends up making money with that position, they just want them to keep trading. And Mark Hanna explains how they don't want clients to sell out, they want them to keep rolling their money into other and other positions. That it's all just a game that they're playing uh, and that their clients are suckers, basically. After the scene, we see Jordan Belfort become a broker himself by finishing his Series 7 exam, which if you aren't familiar in the US, is sort of the registration exam to become a broker and be able to buy and sell different securities for clients. It's known as the General Securities Representative Exam, and it, as the name implies, it gives you general permission over buying and selling different securities. And after this, we get to the first kind of confusing scene about Black Monday, where Jordan Belfort is finally a broker, you know, has his license, and then this catastrophe happens. And this is based on a real event, October 19th, 1987, where basically markets around the world had this sort of flash crash. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 22.6% in a single day, which was its largest single day drop in history. And the really interesting thing about Black Monday is that even to this day, we don't fully know what caused it. There was negative economic news leading up to this decline. There was bad news about a trade deficit, concerns about the US dollar strength, interest rates were rising, markets were already very expensive. So obviously there was a lot of room to fall down, but it's largely believed that automated computer trading and new derivative products like portfolio insurance basically caused a positive feedback loop in the market where stocks fell a bit, computers started you know, clicking on and, and adding more sales to the market, which caused things to fall further, which caused panic selling, which 
repeated the cycle over and over again to an exaggerated degree. And the imbalance of market trades was so bad between sells and buys that many positions had their trading halted or delayed because the system simply couldn't handle the activity going on. And by today's standards, this might not sound all that dramatic, but you have to remember that this was one of the first kind of global market crashes where it wasn't just the US that was hit. Hong Kong saw a decline, Australia, the UK, basically every financial market around the world with even New Zealand seeing a one day decline of 60% of its market. And for a lot of brokers, it was a scary moment to see. It wasn't just their country that was seeing a decline. It was countries around the world all falling at the same time. Now this event actually led to some big changes in the US. The Federal Reserve sort of established a reputation as being a market stabilizer. It stepped in and added liquidity to the markets and kind of prevented this from turning into a larger economic decline. And it's also the event that led to the adoption of circuit breakers which are sort of these automatic protocols that kick in place when markets are declining or when there's a vast number of sell orders entering an exchange, it kicks in to pause the markets to prevent the sort of positive feedback loop that happened during the 1987 crash. So, sorry, a bit of a tangent, but it's an interesting event in the world of finance. Following this, the company, LF Rothschild, actually went bankrupt because of its equity trading business, um, which leaves Jordan Belfort on his own. Next scene in the movie, we see Jordan Belfort getting another job as a broker, this time for a less established company, Investor Center. And here we are introduced to the pink sheets. Pink sheets are a real term that refer to over-the-counter stocks, um, usually penny stocks, very cheap stocks that really don't meet the requirements to be sold on an exchange. It refers to the actual pink piece of paper that the information for these types of stocks are provided on. And it's opposed to, uh, it's even referenced in the movie, the Quotron, which was the digital computer screen that listed the prices. Um, and basically any kind of stock can list over the counter. So that's why the vast majority of pink sheets are penny stocks, you know, unestablished companies that really don't have much value behind them, which means many of them are selling their shares for literally pennies, hence the name of the type of stock. And even though these positions are objectively not as desirable as the blue chip companies that he was selling before, you know, companies like they mentioned Microsoft, Jordan Belfort realizes that on these companies, he gets a 50% commission. Jesus Christ, the spread on these is huge. Yeah, and that's the point. Basically half of whatever he sells, he gets to keep as commission compared to 1% at the company he worked at earlier uh, because these, these positions are so lightly traded, which leads him to realize that, hey, if he can just oversell these to clients, you know, convince them that these are actually promising startups with huge potential, he can make a crap load of money. This is where we get into the more explicit scams that Jordan starts to run to, to make his money. And this specifically is known as a boiler room scam, where basically a call center is operated, where high pressure sales tactics are used and investments are misrepresented just in order to get people to invest into them without the broker themselves disclosing their kind of profit motivations here. As for why it's called a boiler room scam, my understanding is that it's basically just the image that this kind of scam evokes, that these operations are usually run in a boiler room-esque style office, if you will, in a subset of an actual corporate building to sort of hide you know, their tracks. Investor Center, for example, was actually being run under the front of an accounting company, which is why at the beginning of the scene, Jordan Belfort actually has a hard time finding the company. But regardless, he commits to the scam, starts peddling crappy companies onto clients, and actually shows other brokers how it's done. High tech firm out of the Midwest awaiting imminent patent approval. After running this type of scam for some time, Jordan Belfort realizes that, you know, yes, he's able to, to swindle money from sort of less educated investors. He decides to open his own shop to try and do the same thing with wealthier clients, to convince wealthier clients that he's a legitimate broker, uh, to convince high net worth clients to buy crappier positions so he can earn ridiculous commissions on the trades. Gentlemen, welcome to Stratton Oakmont. And right away, Stratton starts getting undesirable attention from the media because of these shady practices that clients are complaining about. Uh, and there's this part where he talks about Forbes coming forward and labeling him the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, although interestingly, that never happened. There is a Forbes piece where they went after Belfort's company and did call him a sort of Robin Hood that took money from investors and put it in his own pocket. They allegedly never called him the Wolf of Wall Street, which leads many to believe that he just called himself that, which is less, less cool. <laughs> anyway, outside of the boiler room scam, then we get into the rat hole scheme. Now a rat hole is a friend like Brad here who held stock in his name from me. Uh, now I don't think rat hole is technically a real scam term, if you will. It might be, uh, but I think uh, Belford might've uh, coined this term, but it's basically just a combination of insider trading 
uh, pumping and dumping and money laundering. Uh, so in the movie, for example, they take a company, Steve Madden Public, uh, which again did actually happen. Stratton Oakmont did actually take Steve Madden Public. They themselves have a lot of insider information that the market does not have on the stock. And Belfort could try to, you know, take advantage of that himself. But given that he's the head of this company, there's going to be a lot of regulators watching his trade uh, and, you know, the money he moves around. So to avoid that scrutiny, he does so through an accomplice, Brad in this case. So then he'll get his brokers to call a bunch of clients and get them to buy this company, Steve Madden, and push the price higher and higher, which obviously will benefit him. And while Steve Madden is kind of the main example of this, it sounds like this happens a bunch throughout the movie where he owns positions secretly, uh, gets his brokers to pump up the price by getting clients to buy it, and then he offloads it through Brad, uh, netting himself a bunch of money. All cash, none of it's on the books. A big no-no, of course, in the eyes of the law. So really those are the illegal things happening in the movie. You have the boiler room scam where brokers are overselling uh, or misrepresenting the, the positions that they're selling and pumping and dumping, where similarly they get the whole brokerage team to pump up the price of stuff and then Belford himself sells his personal stake once the position has been pumped to a really high price, hence the dump aspect of that scam. There is also a bit in the movie where he talks about opening a bank in Switzerland. Uh, I think that's more self-explanatory, but basically Switzerland is kind of known <laughs> for being a safe haven in some cases for different types of bank accounts. Uh, because of their neutral status, they're very independent with their financial system. Um, and in this case, there's also fraud because he forges a signature and blah, 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 holds his money through a relative, even though it belongs to him. And you know, then there's like drugs and driving drunk <laughs> and all the other illegal stuff that happens in the movie, but that's the securities related fraud that occurs. And really all this stuff is covered in the first half of the movie. Basically the other half of the movie is, is drama, <laughs> the unfolding of all this, uh, the FBI agents, you know, finding him out and, and then he rats on his other uh, brokers. Because of all these activities, Jordan Belford was charged with securities fraud, uh, was sentenced to four years in prison, and ordered to pay back over a hundred million dollars to the clients he swindled money from, even though it's believed that he cost investors 200 million dollars through the schemes here. Which might lead you to wonder, well where's Jordan Belford today? Uh, well interestingly he only served 22 months in prison, um, and these days is a motivational speaker. <laughs> He's run a few sales seminars, which they do reference at the end of the movie where they have this kind of Easter egg where the real actual Jordan Belfort is shown on screen introducing Leonardo DiCaprio's Jordan Belfort for his sales seminar. And funny enough, after calling Bitcoin basically a scam, uh, he now runs a cryptocurrency seminar. Old habits die hard. <laughs> so that is the Wolf of Wall Street explained by an investment analyst. Uh, hopefully you found value in this video. Hopefully I was able to add some interesting bits of information. Um, I know it's probably a bit more dry than the movie itself <laughs> since there's a lot going on in the film, uh, but I hope you enjoyed the video. It is an interesting movie, <laughs> far from the experience I've had. Uh, my uh, investment life is a lot more boring, but for sure Wall Street is known for having a toxic work culture and for at times having crazy things happen in offices and whatnot. So it's not all that far-fetched. If you like this video, please do make sure to like and subscribe and let me know your favorite part of the Wolf of Wall Street movie, as well as any other movie that you'd like me to um, ruin. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. We'll see you in the next one. Stay safe out there.